Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, how did campaign spending by special interests influence the results? What I can say definitively is they expect to get something out of it. But what it is, I can't tell you. And we run down results from the state's key elections. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. As many of you know, we record our show on Thursdays. It's hard to remember a time when our Friday night airtime has felt further away. National information most definitely will have changed by the time you sit down to watch us. But here in the state, the election is much more sharply focused. We'll spend extra time with our line panel just dissecting congressional and Senate races, looking at the impact of legislative contests, and figuring out where our state stands in the national picture. Here's the line. New Mexico is firmly in the Biden column, with the Democrat notching a 10-point win on Tuesday. The state's blue wave of 2018 ebbed somewhat, though, as Republican Yvette Harrell ousted Democrat Xochitl Torres Small by an eight-point margin in the second congressional district. And while Ben Ray Lujan is headed to the U.S. Senate, his margin of victory over political neophyte Mark Ronchetti was just five points. What do the results say about New Mexico? The line is here to offer opinions. We've got a great panel today, starting with UNM political science professor Lana Atkinson. We also, have, we also welcome back Martha Burke, political psychologist and author of the book, Your Voice, Your Vote. And completing our virtual table is Merritt Allen. She's the owner of Vox Optima Public Relations. Thank you all for joining in today. Now, let me go back to the second congressional district. That seat was always going to be tenuous for Ms. Silchiel Torres Small. In the end, it wasn't close, Merritt. Does it feel like she lost or that Ms. Harrell won? What was your take on that? Well, uh, absolutely, uh, Yvette Harrell won. And I, I just couldn't be more pleased. Um, I, I've had the pleasure of knowing Yvette Harrell for years. Mm -hmm. And it was a brutal uh, primary. It was a brutal general election. Um, and, and I think it really reflects uh, the view and the desire of the 2nd Congressional District. And I don't, it, what's interesting is I think the more pertinent question is, was that a Democrat versus Republican battle? And it was not, it was a Republican versus Republican battle. And, and my point there is that was um, largely a fight in the primary between two warring factions in the Republican party. Mm -hmm. And even in the general, general election, um, the uh, 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 defeated candidate in the primary, uh, that campaign worked against uh, uh, Yvette Harrell in the general election as well. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that faction was also, of course, uh, working on the Ron Ketty campaign. So what that means for uh, the uh, you know, current powers that be in the state Republican Party, I think will be interesting. Uh, just uh, you know, since I moved back here in 2005, I've been fascinated to watch that often, except for a, a few breaks, the state Republican Party seems to be less occupied with getting folks elected than controlling what Republicans we have left. Mm -hmm. um, it's been an interesting surge in the South. And I've also been frustrated in what seems to, has seemed to me to be a concentration on the Albuquerque Metro and not much else. Yeah. So I feel like the groundswell uh, between Yvette Harrell's uh, election and Crystal uh, Ring and Diamond's election uh, shows, um, I think the, the state party is uh, focusing where a lot of their voters are, which is the South. Mm -hmm. um, they got great results. And um, I also want to note, I don't know if everybody caught that Harry Teague wound up endorsing um, Yvette Harrell uh, a few weeks ago. And that was a very interesting endorsement from a former uh, Democrat holder of the office. So I had again, that. It, I had realized that. It, wasn't even, yeah. it wasn't even a Democrat versus Republican race um, to me in many ways. A lot of pick up on that, if you would. You know, what's interesting, uh, Merritt's talking about the feel of things here. What, what, what was it about for Ms. Torres Small that just didn't punch through this time around? Was there something in the demographics that changed in the interim? What, what happened there? Yeah, certainly, if we look at the data, we can see compared to 2016 that in 2018, 
the stronghold areas of, of Republicans in the South were depressed in terms of turnout. And so mm -hmm. I think that was one factor that helped to get uh, Taurus Small in. Another factor was an incredible campaign that went on by the Democrats. Of course, in this race, everyone was doing mail voting. So, you know, that that was uh, not the same. Mobilization efforts were strong on both sides. I think that was a big factor as well. Mm -hmm. I think another thing is that, you know, the Democrats did spend a lot of time, um, you know, basically defeating Republicans or I should not defeating conservative Democrats in that district. And I think that that in some ways sent a message about, uh, you know, what Democrats wanted from that district and that they wanted someone more progressive than Social Torres Small. There was uh, things about that. And I, I think that tension uh, probably also hurt Torres Small uh, mm -hmm. in the election campaign. Mm -hmm. Martha, you know, there's been some talk out there that Ms. Torres Small just really wasn't true to herself or maybe better said, the way she presented herself wasn't quite truly who she was. There was a lot of gun plays, a lot of Republican light. You might as well have thrown a bucket of red paint on the screen every time one of her ads started. How impactful was that? And again, to pick up on Lana's point, did she just not fit the times, literally? Well, there were a couple of other things at play in the race, but to your point, Jean, she mm -hmm. ran a lot of gun ads when she in the election that she won. Mm -hmm. uh, Fair it enough. It irritated me greatly, I will have to say, as a Democrat when I would see it. Mm -hmm. So that part had not changed a whole lot. But, but you, did they did they take that, that too far a, this a cycle? Lot of the hypocrisy of it. They did indeed. But yeah. I want to say mm -hmm. what were the Republicans really killed it in this election, two things. They registered a whole lot more new Republicans mm -hmm. and they got out there and, and got the turnout. Uh, it was not reported widely, but they organized a, a group of women voters to go door to door uh, for Harold. Mm -hmm. And that was something they had not done before. And that combined with the great upsurge in the registration that they put on, I think made a big difference as well in terms of the ads and not true to yourself and this and that. Mm -hmm. I thought it was one of the most negative campaigns on both sides that we had in the whole state. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that this is a time when we just got to give it to the Republicans on their ground game uh, to get out there, register people, and then make sure the ones that did register got there to the polls. Gotcha. Well said. Um, Merritt, let's talk about Mark, Ron Mark Ronchetti. Interestingly, that Senate race went the way most people thought it would, but a five-point race is narrower than the polls we saw, certainly, and he outperformed the president here in the state. I, I want to pick up on how he did, but also in the future for Mark Ronchetti. Uh, could he have done something a little bit differently to close that five-point gap, or was that just going to be the ceiling and that was that? Well, I certainly think, um, and this is a trend uh, we saw in uh, nationwide in uh, the Senate and House races. If you look at uh, really a, a major Democratic loss in the House and uh, the Senate staying relatively the same with a few seats swapping out, but roughly um, uh, the numbers staying the same as, as to uh, where they were in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of moderate uh, Republicans who uh, have a personal dislike of President Trump split their uh, split their ballot, and so were comfortable um, uh, not voting for Trump, but wanted to uh, uh, keep uh, uh, keep Republicans uh, in, in the Senate in the Senate and the House. Uh, Ron Ketty, um, you know, had us, uh, you know, came in with statewide recognition from his uh, television career. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think he brought a lot of depth to the campaign on issues, um, uh, but he uh, was supported by um, a veteran campaign team, got Susana Martinez elected twice, um, and, and ran a very moderate campaign. So mm -hmm. not, you know, not an ex uh, extreme conservative, which for um, Albuquerque and Northern New Mexico is important. Um, had the support of uh, the Albuquerque Republican establishment, which is all, uh, also important. Sure. So uh, from that perspective, uh, uh, yes, that's true. I think it would have been an uphill battle for any Republican because, um, as you noted uh, before taping, uh, Ben Ray Lujan knows how to fundraise. 
and he knows how, he knows how to campaign. He sh certainly showed that as uh, the Democratic congressional uh, campaign chair. I mean, Merritt, I'm interested to know if you thought the previously mentioned uh, ground game for CD2 might have helped Mr. Ron Ketty as well. Um, you know, I don't know that, um, I don't know that that carried over. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't, I don't think, uh, the Republic, the Republicans are not as well organized, uh, in Bernalillo County. They are in the rural areas, but mm -hmm. I think in the Albuquerque Metro, um, there is, uh, there are some grassroots efforts with individual, uh, candidates, mm -hmm. uh, who, who do some really, uh, impressive things, but as a, uh, uh, as, as an, an organ as organizations go, uh, the attention is was not spent by the New Mexico GOP um, up north, nor on on the Senate campaign. Really, New Mexico GOP was focused on uh, Harold uh, Harold primarily. That was that gotcha. was that for. I uh, from my perspective. Understood. Yeah. Even in hindsight, I can understand that. Lana, pick up on that if you would. What happened there for Mr. Ron Ketty? Was that just his natural ceiling or, or did, was there something else lurking in the numbers that he could have taken advantage of? Well, I mean, obviously Walsh is potential spoiler there. Mm. Um, there were maybe what, 24,000 votes for him that wouldn't have put him over. But if, uh, you know, more than half of those, which I would believe would have gone to the Republican, uh, you know, he would have had more votes. So there was a spoiler in that race that probably mm -hmm. added a dimension to him uh, that is important to consider. Mm -hmm. Martha, you know, let's talk about uh, who won, which would be Ben Ray Lujan, certainly. It wasn't quite the winning going away as some people anticipated there. Does that handicap him at all going into this or the fact that it just doesn't matter at the end of the day what the margin was? I don't think it matters a whole lot. I, mm -hmm. I think uh, it was a surprise to me the, as it was to most people, I think that it was not a, a larger margin, but 5% is pretty big these sure. days anyway. I mean, it was never that close. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron Ketty, I didn't think he had anything going for him except name recognition. And mm -hmm. so that was uh, a factor, I think. Ben Ray is uh, a seasoned politician. He knows how the government works. Uh, he knows how to function in the government. He has proven that. I think that people relate to that. Mm -hmm. uh, it sort of irritated me that Ronchetti seemed to uh, want his family to be running as much as himself. And I, I did not uh, think that was a very good strategy. I know Ben Ray is a single guy. And uh, so he didn't have the family to trot out, uh, but he didn't need it. Mm -hmm. uh, he has functioned well as a representative. I think he is uh, absolutely a natural for the office that he won. And I think the voters knew that. Gotcha. And let's not forget, the Lujans are a dynasty. <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. pretty hard to break into. I mean, mm -hmm. my God, he practically grew up in the roundhouse. Exactly. So, uh, he I knows how the levers of power the work. The only surprise yeah. to me, Gene, was the margin. That's gotcha. It. Gotcha. I've got to bring this on the table um, with the three guests we have here for sure. But let me just kind of go through this. New Mexico now has four of five seats in the House or Senate held by minorities with a bet Harrell and Deb Holland. It has two Native women in Congress and all three congressional seats are held by women of color. Lana, let me start with you. How does that how does that resume feel to you and what does that say about New Mexicans and how we vote? You know, I think it says a lot about our state and our state's diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a really high percentage of Native Americans, relatively speaking, around 10%. So it's so mm -hmm. great that we can have two Native Americans in office and two from different parties. That is a complete first. I mean, and I, I think it talks to the diversity of opinion within different cultures and, and different ideas. And I think that's really a, an important statement, mm -hmm. um, not only uh, about New Mexico, uh, well, especially about New Mexico and that the candidates that we choose. Merritt, real quick, if I can do 20 seconds with you and Martha on this. Just, um, I think it just shows uh, in general, um, being a candidate is so hard um, and so stressful. And I just think it shows uh, women have the resilience to uh, withstand this, perhaps more so uh, than men. Uh, it, it, science shows that women have better endurance. I, I'm not going to argue that. I've, I've witnessed that. Absolutely. Martha Burke, <laughs> what's your sense of 
uh, where well, we sit now as a state. That, that I love about it, uh, the ethnicity notwithstanding, mm -hmm. is that women candidates, female candidates, are now starting to be seen as normal at uh. last. Uh, people don't think it's a big deal anymore when a woman goes after a seat. And that's really uh, a changeover as recently as 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a significant factor that uh, we all need to pay attention to. It's amazing that we have three women in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, on the national scale, uh, congressional Republicans, uh, women had a night for themselves as well. It's very interesting. All right, we're back in just a moment to talk about legislative races. See you in a second. But it's oil and gas that we really see, you know, continuing to pump large amounts of money into the state uh, and also oil and gas industries in the state contributing large amounts of money. That's fairly split in state, out of state, unlike a lot of other industries, money from money coming from New Mexico corps and then out of state corporations. New Mexico has what our professor Lana Atkinson refers to as quote, the trifecta. That is the same party has majorities, strong ones in both legislative chambers and the governor's office. Democrats like that for a number of reasons. We'll focus on two of them. First, the legislative agenda. Second, redistricting. Let's start with the agenda. Progressives who unseated more conservative Democrats in the primaries didn't win every general election race, notably John Arthur Smith's old seat and Clemente Sanchez's old seat will be Republican. But progressives hung on to four seats held by moderate Democrats. And Democrats unseated Republicans Candace Gould and Sandra Rue. What's more, they picked up Bill Payne's old seat. That's interesting. The Senate has not looked favorably upon recreational cannabis bills on increasing permanent fund payouts to benefit early childhood education or on repealing unenforceable law that criminalizes abortion, as Marcia, Martha mentioned a little bit ago. And Martha, sticking with you, do you see a significant change in the chances for those issues? Well, the I would of hope so, mm -hmm. uh, Gene, particularly the 1969 law. As I uh, mentioned earlier, we are in some danger of having Roe v. Wade overturned in the next few years mm -hmm. because of the recent Supreme Court change with Judge Barrett being elevated uh, to the court because she is against Roe as now a whole majority of, of the court is. Our law will automatically kick in and it essentially outlaws abortion uh, if Roe is overturned. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a big factor. I was surprised because John Arthur Smith got lost his seat over his defection. He had promised advocates and others that he would vote to overturn that law and then he didn't do it, but he wasn't the only one. I believe there were six or seven others, but he got punished. He lost in the primary. However, mm -hmm. the pro-choice side lost in the general. Ty ab abortion, uh, the right, the New Mexico right to life has endorsed her. Mm -hmm. uh, so that vote is going to go against advocates for reproductive rights should it come up again, that particular mm. vote. Now, the other seat, the progressive did win, Mary Kay Papen seat, so mm -hmm. that uh, that did turn over. But I think that uh, the progressives are going to be under a lot of pressure depending on what makes it to the Supreme Court and when. Gotcha. Hey, Merritt, interesting. I want to pick up something Martha just said there. Is there now... Uh, additional pressure on more conservative Democrats out there like Pete Campos or Joseph Cervantes to fall in line now that they're sort of without a backup in a, in a sense. Um, I think that really depends on the chamber major uh, majority leaders and what they decide to do and okay. how much power they decide to flex mm -hmm. and what happens in, um, in caucus meetings and in, in private meetings. Um, certainly, uh, power like that's been flexed before and longstanding, uh, as we just uh, saw uh, this year, where longstanding city members have primary opponents and find themselves on the way out. And uh, particularly if um, uh, either of those gentlemen are considered to be a, a threat or a rival, uh, uh, they may certainly see some pressure. You know, I, I would like to comment, I, I found fascinating, and of course I'm always interested 
in uh, House Districts 38 and 39 because that's my hometown, Silver City. And Grant County is red. I don't know if you saw that, but Rudy uh, Martinez lost his seat to Luis Terrazas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that was, uh, that's huge. I don't, that, that uh, was uh, fascinating for me to see. Um, and I think I want to call out uh, Representative Rebecca Dow, who just won her third term in House District 38, which has the other parts of Grant County and um, like some Sierra County. Uh, she has been a real uh, force uh, she and Louise uh, campaign together. She works on both sides of the aisle. Uh, she works. Uh, mm -hmm. She goes to meetings uh, incessantly. She is a full-time, although unpaid, uh, legislator. And the other thing I want to note is a group she's active with, founded by Representative Kelly Fajardo, also reelected uh, this year, called RISE, which is nonpartisan focused on electing pro-business uh, women and grooming candidates. Mm -hmm. Crystal Diamond Runyon, who is our Arthur Smith seat, is a graduate of that program. So when we talk about electing women uh, to the legislature, there is um, an ongoing effort, a nonprofit academy uh, that exists uh, for just that aim. And in a very high profile race that got attention throughout the campaign for its tremendous fundraising, we've seen um, the first success of that. So mm -hmm. I, found, I found that fascinating. And um, the Lieutenant Governor's old Senate seat, um, also in Grant County, came very close to turning red uh, by just um, a couple, uh, couple hundred votes, I think. Right. So I, I just want to remind everyone, Grant County is where Salt of the Earth was filmed. Very, <laughs> it's a great movie. That's right. Right. Uh, county. And I think that points um, to the ongoing rural urban divide. We've been talking about it for years. Right. Let me pick up with Lana on that very point there. You know, Lana, I'm curious your, your take on this sort of a theme here, how blue really is the metro area. Uh, but Democrats have eroded Republican support on the west side and now in the heights. And we've got an overwhelming Democrat heavy uh, contingent from the Albuquerque metro area now in our legislature. How, it, what, what's happening here? Is there some shifts going on here that we need to know about? Yeah, it doesn't look like, you know, in the end, maybe the shifts aren't so great in terms of numbers, but they are in terms of region. Okay. And, you know, we are really seeing and continuing to see this, this <coughs> urban rural split in New Mexico, uh, you know, expand. And absolutely Albuquerque metropolitan area is, is a deep blue. But if we combine sort of, you know, Las Cruces, Santa Fe and Albuquerque, that's about half the state. Mm -hmm. And then you get about half of the other voters in the rural areas of the state. So it, it really, you know, creates an opportunity for competition statewide. And, you know, there are a lot of conservative Hispanics. And I know that the uh, Republican Party has certainly tried to make uh, inroads into those groups. Identity is a hard thing to turn around, but there are certainly issues uh, between conservatives and liberals, that there are wedges there that are opportunities um, uh, for the party to make advances in rural areas. We are certainly seeing that in terms of votes mm -hmm. and um, you know, seeing what that looks like on the lay of the land ultimately is gonna be interesting, but we are definitely seeing what's going on nationally. This urban uh, rural split uh, is expanding and is gonna be a dominant feature of our politics for the future. Mm, no doubt, Martha. Republicans did pick up at least three seats in rural parts of our state in southern and central New Mexico. And interesting, they ousted uh, Democratic incumbents in two cases, defeating progressive Democrats who had defeated more moderate incumbents in the June primary. Uh, so there's a lot of moving pieces going on here. It, are Democrats just in a, in, a, in a period where they just have to find their way just a little bit? It's not as if they're sliding, but just something's not quite cohesive, it seems like, from these results. Well, I think that sometimes there's a little bit of overhyping about how uh, liberal the electorate is becoming. As Lana just pointed out, there are a lot of Hispanics that are conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, on other issues, uh, they're going to favor Democrats on many issues, but not the most progressive Democrats in, in some cases. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a matter of reading the tea leaves, Gene, and finding that sort of golden mean, because I think that obviously we have seen that the, the less progressive Democrats can prevail in those districts, but you move them over just a little bit and 
they're going to get beat. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, a matter of demographics, I think, as well as tradition in those areas. And our demographics are changing all over the state. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. We just need to pay attention to what the larger shifts are and how that's going to drift down or shift down to the political scene. Gotcha. Let me bounce back to Lana real quick here. It's a good time to bring up redistricting. Um, now that we start to see, you know, how and why it's important. Could you kind of take us through the process real quick for folks who may not kind of get what's, what's at stake here? And then we'll talk about uh, the, the, the people at play to make this happen. Right after, right every 10 years after a census, we have to redistrict every, uh, every legislative and executive body, well, legislative body, I should say, in the state. So that was city council, legislature. So of course, at the state level, that's for the, the legislature and the Senate. And that is a monstrous task. And in the past two times, there has not been a tri trifecta. There's been a Republican governor in the last two redistrictings, but now we have all three parties in the same place. And the Supreme Court has said that party gerrymandering is okay. Mm -hmm. So I am expecting, uh, you know, definitely historically, uh, redistricting has been about sort of saving incumbent seats. But I think that this time there's going to be a lot of pressure and interest by, uh, you know, the party in power to uh, create a stronger uh, democratic state. Mm -hmm. Is it can they redraw congressional districts as well? Do I have that right? Yes. yes. So, okay. you know, the, yes. And they're going to have to, in fact, that more people have moved out of the second CD than any other DC if, CD. If you look at the numbers, their, you know, vote totals are much lower than the other congressional districts. Okay. And so we're going to have to add, you know, add areas, add demographic add regions to that. And so how you add those regions is going to affect the outcomes in those races. Interesting. Uh, Merritt, we're gonna, a little touched on time here for Republicans. What does this all mean? Well, um, I am currently on um, the redistricting commission that's looking at different options. And so it's been fascinating. And there is, we're, we're looking at different ways um, to create redistricting maps. Um, there, and there are several members of the legislature who are also on this um, uh, independent uh, commission. Uh, I, and I, I think there is a lot at stake uh, for Republicans and uh, just just getting anywhere close to parity, getting close to um, uh, you know uh, f physical uh, geographic uh, uh, contiguity, uh, fifty anything close to 50-50 uh, 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 voter registration, maintaining communities of maintaining communities of interest, all of this is at stake. Um, of course, everyone on the commission, Republican or Democrat, say, "Oh, we don't want gerrymandering," but and we and we have two retired Supreme Court justices on the commission as well. But I think everybody knows, and especially if you saw the heated heated races uh, for Supreme Court and and appellate uh, court justices, I think everyone knows in 2021 there are going to be a lot of lawsuits. That's an interesting mm -hmm. point there. We'll tackle that one at that time. Martha Burke for Democrats redistricting. It's, there's some obvious answers here, but intra-party fighting, you know, all that kind of stuff. How, is there a plan, not that you would be privy to this, but should Democrats have a plan going in for this, go for broke, try to, you know, just really get as much as they can while they can? Well, Gene, I think in any kind of negotiations, uh, that is probably the mindset that the negotiators start with. Right. Because mm -hmm. if you don't start there, you're going to end up behind the eight ball. you you got to start with more than you think you can get. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that is a bad strategy. Just go for it, see what happens. I'm sure the Republicans are thinking the same way, mm -hmm. uh, but somewhere there's got to be some accommodation on both sides, I would imagine. And uh, maybe that's how you get there. Do you get there quicker by starting out playing hardball or not? Uh, I think most people would say, go, as you said, go for as much as you can get and then see what happens. There you go. We'll have to wrap that there. We're talking national trends in New Mexico's place in that picture when this group returns. The folks at New Mexico Ethics Watch have continued to follow the impact of money in politics during the campaign. Massive spending on advertising and lobbying is perhaps a given in today's political climate, 
but the group is pushing to make that information as easy to find as possible. NMIF producer Matt Grubb spoke with Kathleen Sabo, the executive director of New Mexico Ethics Watch. Kathleen Sabo, when you gather information um, on campaign finance reports, lobbyist reports, what are you hoping to do? What we're hoping to do is bring to light uh, who is at least attempting to influence uh, candidates. And, you know, that, that may be harsh, Matt, because certainly candidates will deny influence, but at least uh, voters can see who is wanting to influence a candidate or at least help a candidate get elected because they think uh, they'd be good for them in the legislature. Sure, sure. Um, you, uh, you're being fairly diplomatic. I think it used to just be journalists who were um, sort of so cynical to, you know, like, of course, this is influencing them. But I think the public might be getting there, too. There's so much money. Uh, as you've gone through this election and you've looked at these reports, what kind of money is being spent and, and who is spending it inside the state, outside the state, that sort of thing? Well, as you may know, we've been focusing on a couple of industries, all of which we reported on earlier this year. Oil and gas is one of them. We've also been taking another look at cannabis, firearms, tobacco, film, and now we're, we're starting a new look at, at payday loan industry because unfortunately that might be rising to the top. But it's oil and gas that we really see, you know, continuing to pump large amounts of money into the state uh, and also oil and gas industries in the state contributing large amounts of money. That's fairly split in state, out of state, unlike a lot of other industries, money from money coming from New Mexico corps and then out of state corporations. Okay. When you issued the release or, or the report back in March, um, mm -hmm. this was looking at uh, from 2017 to 2020, you found about 11 and a half million dollars had been um, either donated or, um, contributed or used to pay for lobbyists, basically. Um, the oil and gas industry, their spokesman said, oh, this is a, this is a political attack. Uh, walk me through that. I, I would assume you think it is not a political attack. Well, we don't. It's all, it's all public records. And it's all um, you know, right there for people who want to see it. What we're doing is compiling the data and putting it out there for people to see. Uh, that 11 and a half million included expenditures, it included direct contributions, it included lobbyist contributions, it included contributions from industry PACs. And like I said, it's not the only industry that we're looking at. It is one of the, one of the largest contributors, certainly within the state. You know, it's become obviously, oil and gas is highly political at this point. We saw that in the presidential debate when Joe Biden got in a little bit of trouble talking about the transition, moving from oil and gas to alternative energy. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, they've filled our coffers here in the state and they've, they've supported education uh, wildly, you know. And so, so it is, you know, there, there are politics involved with it now, but as far as we're concerned, we're just, we're just shining a light on, on what's in the public records. Let's talk about those specific public records. What can the public see? Um, earlier this election cycle, you took a look specifically at financial disclosures, which are different than a campaign finance reform. First, can you explain the difference between those two and then tell me what you found with, with financial disclosures? Well, f uh, financial disclosures are required by certain people to be filed every year. And they are also required of every candidate to be filed upon declaration of candidacy. So we did look at financial disclosure statements. You know, at this point, nobody, including us, really has the time to go through every financial disclosure statement uh, in depth. But what we were looking for is, did candidates file them? Can does the public have access to them? And we found, I think, a total of 34 or more of candidates that were missing. So we worked with the Secretary of State's office, we worked with the candidates, and they're all up online now. So that's, that's what financial disclosure statements are. This is personal information that people are required to provide by law. The campaign finance uh, are when 
candidates have to report contributions, expenses. So who's giving and what are they spending? And so that's, that's the difference there. And they're on different schedules, obviously, but we think they're both important. We think they're both incredible tools for voters in trying to decide for whom they wish to vote. They certainly are. Those financial disclosure forms reveal basically where our unpaid citizen legislators and, and other officials, um, where they're making their money, where they have their money. They don't always disclose what you're hoping they will disclose though, right? Our, our law is really anemic. We testified before the State Ethics Commission in early October about the Financial Disclosure Act and why it needs to be reformed. Uh, so no, I mean, there are some legislators who just regularly put NA, not applicable, not applicable, not applicable. There aren't enough people in the Secretary of State's office to audit those. And so, you know, we don't get the information we want. Uh, we hear about them mostly during the season because somebody will look at their opponent's disclosure statement. And I believe that happened with Rebecca Dow's uh, opponent. And, but, but otherwise, they're, you know, what's required by law is pretty scant. Is there any appetite at the legislature, as far as you can tell, to correct this or to pass a law that's a little more robust? Um, it's kind of an interesting ask, right, for lawmakers, because you're asking them to be willing to disclose more of their financial situation. I, I know, and uh, what surprised me, and I was so pleased after we, we had a voluminous 2018 report uh, just before that election, and right after that, Senator Mark Morris, Republican Senator Mark Morris, uh, called me up and said, I'd like to work on reforming this. And we still, you know, with everything that's been happening, uh, whether it's a budget session or then the pandemic, pandemic, we really haven't gotten down to business on that with him. Uh, but that was a that was a hopeful sign that there's a new sort of breed of legislator that really wants to, um, you know, be more transparent. I will tell you this: we had hoped that this year might be a year that the State Ethics Commission, who is charged by law to to suggest reforms, might uh, be supportive of some financial disclosure changes. But but they've got a lot on their plate. They're required by law to suggest reforms to the Campaign Reporting Act the Lobbyist Regulation Act and the Voter Action Act this in this coming legislature. So it could be that financial disclosure is a little bit down the line, but those other acts are in need of reform as well. Sure. And they've been um, fairly aggressive in terms of what they've, what they've wanted to do, I think, um, at, the, at the Ethics Commission. I wanted to um, chat just a little bit about that uh, complaint that you mentioned that Karen Whitlock um, filed uh, against Rebecca Dow. She was uh, claiming that she didn't disclose her status as a legislator um, in contracts that she had with two state agencies. The Ethics Commission can't rule on that. Is that correct? During an election? Well, prior to the election. Right. There's a blackout period for uh, adjudication of, of complaints uh, for, in, cer in certain areas, and that's certainly one of them. That's something we'd like to see changed. I mean, we're going to be suggesting some reforms in that regard that potentially um, anything that arises concerning financial disclosures, whether they've been filed, uh, might be able to be adjudicated because it is such important information for voters to know. But but the, the commission could not, could not adjudicate it that during that time. However, Karen Whitlock could go to the press and say, hey, I filed this, which was, which was interesting as well. And frankly, if we hadn't been able to get those uh, legislators' um, financial disclosure statements up on the on the Secretary of State's database. We were getting ready to file a, an ethics complaint, you know, so to make sure those were up there. And we knew it wouldn't be able to be adjudicated, but that's one of the reforms we might be suggesting. Sure, lawmakers oftentimes come up with sort of worst case scenarios when they think mm -hmm. about passing laws to restrict themselves. This was one of them actually, that, that people are going to use the ethics commission to sort of game voters and to file something by law, it has to be uh, kept secret unless the person filing it discloses it. Um, and when you're a candidate running against someone and you file against someone, you can disclose it. Why wouldn't you, right? Right. 
Well, uh, and so we only saw one though. I mean, so, so to me, you know, and I'm sorry, you know, Rebecca Dow might feel differently about it, but, but to me, there wasn't anyone who was trying, you know, there wasn't an overwhelming, uh, you know, sort of dishonest approach to it. And, and maybe not at all. I don't know. Sure. I mean, we, ha- we have yet to see what comes out of this complaint. It's still a valid right. complaint, despite the fact that, that Rebecca Dow won the election. Right. Yeah, um, we'll see. We just have about a couple minutes left. Um, you mentioned that you are going to be looking at payday lending because you expect that to be um, a big issue in the upcoming legislative session. When voters look at the reports that you put out, you're basically hoping to give them information about who's putting money into the system. Uh, what do the people putting money in the system expect to get out of it? It's eleven and a half million dollar question. Well, listen, uh, what I can say definitively is they expect to get something out of it, but what it is, I can't tell you. Now, in our in our past reports, we have um, shown how people who've received money have then voted. But can we make a direct correlation? Absolutely not. It's not possible unless somebody comes directly out and says, yes, I voted to uh, reduce the royalties on oil and gas because Chevron gave me uh, $60,000 for my campaign. No one's going to say that. No one's going to, or if they do, uh, welcome that level of transparency. But uh, so, so all we can do is sort of just show, you know, here are the people who got money and here's how they voted. You can draw your own conclusions. Do they want, do you want them as your lawmakers? Fair enough. Kathleen Sabo with New Mexico Ethics Watch. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Matt. Be well. You too. The final leg of our election significance tour starts with our place on the national stage. It's been a long time since we've been the bellwether we once were. Not since 2004 has the state voted for a Republican for president. Joe Biden won by 10 points this time around, though. Though Republicans once more laid claim to the second congressional district. And Lana, Does New Mexico as a state feel solid blue to you? No, it's not a deep blue. I always say it's violent, violent, no, violet. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's very clear signs. I mean, Democrats don't win by enough in the state to Mm. be um, deep blue, either at the presidential level or the statewide level in terms of federal contest. Mm -hmm. Vet Harrell just took the second CD really large. And uh, of course, registrations for Democrats in the state are under 50%. Hmm. Interesting point. Merritt, pick up on that. Uh, Same exact question. Does it work for you? Um, Well, no. Um, As a, you know, at at the state level, um, I almost feel like we are in a a democratic machine. Um, And I don't think that, you know, and it's an easy political trope to say, that's why we're at the bottom of everything. It's the Democrats' fault. Like one party rule, um, universal power universally corrupts. And uh, I think that is an issue that we deal with at the state level. Um, But no, at uh, at a national level, I I definitely agree. We're we're not a deep blue state. Mm -hmm. I do think nationally, though, this was not... Um, a referendum on Democrats or Republicans either. It's kind of like the second district. Um, you know, th- this country was founded and it's been a, a phenomenal success. Uh, we're the first re- really modern republic. Um, this was supposed to be a government that was not about rulers. It was uh, flexible enough that we could uh, elect government after government and these things would change. And um, it was about the republic and not the ruler. And we have a very, very strong president right now, and he is very personality based. And the Republican Party has embraced this personality um, uh, cult, if you were around the president and based the whole campaign on that. And to me, this was a refer- referendum on ruler versus republic. Mm, and you that's can- interesting. It's it's been very it's it's been very close and closer than a lot of people or pollsters uh, wanted to think. We saw this um, almost a hundred well uh, eighty years ago, I guess I could say, um, with uh, FDR of uh, four terms. Oh my gosh, can you even imagine that today? And it took some time to kind of unwind that 
and the successive presidents had some interesting problems and issues to manage as well as a population who is very used to, well, FDR, he's always been the president. He's always right. president. Who are yeah. you? And so whoever is president in um, 2021, it looks like as of taping, it's leaning toward um, uh, Joe Biden. And whoever is president in 2024 are going to have to manage the expectations of half the country wanting a ruler instead of a republic. Mm -hmm. And we see that in New Mexico, the trends of the rural areas who strongly supported Trump, they wanted this strong leader rather than a republic and figuring out issues on their own. And I think that's a very um, complex issue. And it's not just being a Democrat or being a Republican. That is fantastically complex as I listen to you say it. Martha, you know, that complexity, it's easy to say it's a rural versus urban divide, but the rural parts of our state are going through their own changes. The urban parts of our state are going through their own changes. You know, where does this all shake out at the end of the day? Well, Talking about New Mexico on the national stage, mm -hmm. I don't know where the demographics will, whether that will change our place on the national stage, mm -hmm. but I do think it might change. And there's a lot of scuttlebutt going around, which is uh, fun to follow. Uh, it may not be worth a darn, uh, but let me tell you some of it. So let's suppose Biden is elected. Mm -hmm. uh, Udall, of course, has been mentioned as Secretary of the Interior, mm -hmm. but so has Heinrich. Mm -hmm. And so some of the scuttlebutt is, well, if Heinrich is appointed Secretary of the Interior, the governor appoints someone to take his place until an election can be held. Mm -hmm. Maybe she'll appoint herself. Interesting. Think about that. <laughs> <laughs> that qualifies as the, scuttlebutt. That absolutely yeah, qualifies. Right. And <laughs> on, on the other side of Capitol Hill, let me just say, or Please. that same side actually now, because it will be the Senate. But mm -hmm. Ben Ray Lujan has made quite a mark for himself in the House, mm -hmm. in the Democratic leadership in Washington. I don't expect that to change at all when he moves over to the Senate. I think we're going to be hearing a lot about him. I think he'll do a lot for New Mexico as he ha has as a House member. And so I think we're pretty fortunate to have him. Uh, one more thing I ran across sort of apropos of this subject is the Ledger Fernandez seat, CD3, mm. mm -hmm. and how it has been a stepping stone up. Uh, Bill Richardson had that seat. He became governor. Uh, ben Ray had the seat. And now he's a senator. So what does that mean for the future for our first uh, Hispanic woman in that seat, we don't know, but it's a stepping stone. That's interesting to contemplate. A uh, lot of, we fell just shy of 70% turnout. I would have bet money we would have gone over that number, but be that as it may, it's a very weird year. 200,000 Democrats cast absentee ballots, as you know, and 200,000 Republicans voted early in person. Um, what should voting rules look like going forward to encourage turnout? Is there anything we could do to get over that threshold? That I mean, that's a really tough threshold. I, you, you know, certainly we could we could uh, expand that, but that's as good as we did in two thousand eight. That's a real high mark generally across the nation. Thinking about a seventy percent, right? Uh, you know, registration vote. So so that's very high. But how do we do that? I mean, I think the things that are are really creating sort of uh, opportunities for mobilization, and this is where one place that I think social media plays uh, a positive role, maybe the only place. Um, is in, at least in politics, is that I do think it mobilizes people to turn out. You know, mm -hmm. getting those messages uh, on your Facebook and Twitter and all of that is really encouraging. And seeing your friends and relatives and other people you know uh, voting is is really relevant to motivating yourself to vote. So what we do know about voting, we think that you know things like education and and age and these resources matter. But but those are really related to networks. What really mm -hmm. matters to voter turnout is being part of a network of people who are turning out. And so Lana, can I interrupt for a quick second? What mm -hmm. about the, the, the quality of the information these folks are receiving in their network? Some might consider them a bubble. Some might consider them just being around like-minded people. Is, is there a quality threshold using that approach? 
Well, you know, I was just talking about the mobilization, the information uh, fragmentation is a, a huge problem going on in the country mm -hmm. um, and it's very polarizing. So that's not a negative, that's a negative about social media, but a real positive is that it's encouraging people to participate and become civically engaged. And ultimately, hopefully that will improve information as well. Gotcha. Hey, um, got to ask about Steve Pierce. Merritt, um, I'm curious about his performance as party leader. He, he swore up and down he was going to deliver Trump or de delivered New Mexico for Trump. That did not happen. He also said he would flip CD2. That did happen. Has, is he in a better position than he was six months ago with the party or is everything still sort of the same? I think um, uh, CD2 plus uh, Crystal uh, uh, Runyon Diamond, mm -hmm. um, I think he's in a very good position. I think- John Arthur Smith's old seat, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also think um, because uh, Ron, Ketty, uh, Ron Ketty's campaign was managed by his primary rival uh, and their rival camp, that also strengthens him. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I think of, of uh, the dueling factions, the Republican Party, uh, Steve Pierce's certainly came out strong. Really? You know, it's interesting. We had, we had uh, it's not, not challenging when I say really like that. We had him on in our Tuesday night coverage mm -hmm. during New Mexico PBS. We did a live stream. He was willing to come on and talk a little bit about it. Um, I, I just, I, I try to press them just a little bit about this idea for Trump and delivering New Mexico. Does that not diminish him at all uh, in the party's eyes? Or is it just people took it more as just noise as something to say back then? Trump's campaign director um, uh, arrived in the state well over a year ago. Yeah. Uh, and she was uh, uh, very charismatic, worked very hard, mobilized um, a great deal of effort, worked hand in hand, uh, with the with the state GOP, and so I guess though I would put it, uh, the, the Trump campaign in New Mexico is not synonymous with the New Mexico GOP. Mm -hmm. So I yeah I, I I feel among the the hardcore Republicans who follow this I don't I don't see this as a, a big blemish on Steve Pierce. Gotcha, Martha Burke. Interestingly, um, I'm wondering if you feel like. Who owns the Democratic Party in New Mexico now? Is this Mr. Heinrich's party? Is this, who, who's, whose party is it at this point? Well, the governor has done a good job on COVID. So mm -hmm. maybe it's her party right mm -hmm. now. Uh, she's done everything she could do, I think. And she's getting very high marks, although our situation is not as good. Um, is it still maybe the party of Udall or maybe becoming the party of Heinrich? I don't know, Gene. Um, neither of them are known, as, you know, they're not uh, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and, and neither is New Mexico, as Lana has, has so aptly pointed out. Mm -hmm. So maybe the Democratic Party is up for grabs. But I think right now, uh, given the COVID situation and the performance of our leaders, it, it's got to belong to the governor. Is, is she the one that stirs the drink, so to speak? Is she the power broker? I guess is what I'm getting at as well. We've got obviously a midterm coming up. We've got her own, you know, <laughs> reelection stuff coming up. It, it, is she the one to actually make things work here? Yeah, I think she is, Jean, but mm -hmm. I think she doesn't do it as blatantly or openly as many others have in the past. Mm -hmm. Bill Richardson being one, I worked for Richardson mm -hmm. in his administration. He's a very different personality. Uh, I think she, she is a power broker. I think she wields a lot of power, but she doesn't do it uh, in a screamy way. Right. Uh, she does it uh, quietly and effectively, uh, mm -hmm. generally. And this, I just have to say, going back to Merritt's uh, conversation about Pierce, this mm -hmm. is something that uh, is, to me, irritating about Pierce. He seems to want to do that heavy hand, heavy hand. And I don't think that uh, endears him to some members of his own party. Uh, mm -hmm. Merritt may disagree, but I think he, he's a little bit too, too much of a hammer. At mm -hmm. times. Merritt, you want to react to that? Do you have uh, a sense of that? You know, I think um, in the New Mexico GOP, you kind of have to do that. There are so many people um, scrambling um, to unseat you. Um, 
and it, it's that I guess is my pet peeve is I, I've said this so many times to keep track of who hates whom in the New Mexico GOP. I need an Excel <laughs> spreadsheet and to update it every week. Right. So um, you kind of have to play the heavy to stay on top of all that. And what that gets in the way of is getting more Republicans elected. The real loser uh, of, of all that uh, infighting are Republican candidates and mm -hmm. Uh, certainly, we see that uh, by concentrating so hard on CD2 and I think John Arthur Smith's seat, uh, at Albuquerque, just uh, right. the these heights, which should traditionally be um, a Republican stronghold, is just, um, you know, just a sea of cerulean. I love that. So many colors today. I just, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your thoughts and opinions this week. We very much appreciate it. I want to personally thank everyone on our staff and crew for the Yeoman's work on election night. I'd also like to thank all the panelists you've watched here on the line. Join me on a five hour Zoom broadcast that night. It was a lot of fun. The biggest thanks goes to you, our viewers, who took the ride with us leading up to and including election night and now beyond. We should probably also thank the officials in charge of our election process in New Mexico. They truly got the job done. Now, it's a cliche to say democracy is messy. It's been a messy four years, but we will stay the course here at NMPBS, bringing you our best each and every week. Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you.